Let me just give the audience a brief word of introduction for each of you, and then we'll launch right into the conversation where Steve left it off. And I think many of you know Vonda very well, uh, know Medea, who recently wrote a great book, Pakistan Under Siege. I'm just going to give a short personal introduction of each of them, which is to say, to me, these are two of the bravest and most uh, ingenious and resourceful field researchers that I have ever met in my career. And they've both done amazing work in Pakistan and Afghanistan uh, in this regard. And so their credentials, in addition to their PhDs and blah, 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 uh, could not be more compelling for me. And so uh, I'm really honored to be up here with them both. And we'll, we'll start with Vonda. And Vonda, I just would like to frame the question of how do you assess the prospects for peace in Afghanistan? And of course, also, what advice would you give to policymakers as they pursue whatever chance we have now of a successful peace process? Well, thank you, Mike, and thank you all for coming. Um, we are really at a vital uh, step or vital period in U.S. engagement in Afghanistan. Clearly, the pressures for U.S. disengagements are enormous and very much uh, uh, emanate from the White House. The peace negotiations uh, today is uh, at the most advanced stage. Uh, Particularly what's been happening this week in Qatar really suggests significant movement on um, both the U.S. and the Taliban side, at least on the U.S.-Taliban deal, where um, there is very little clarity and, in fact, tremendous amount of tripwires, dangers, um, and lack of resolution is on the Afghan side. I um, agree very much with Steve Hadley, who wouldn't. He's one of the most uh, impressive, uh, knowledgeable U.S. Uh, uh, foreign policy officials. Uh, so it would be foolish for any, anyone to disagree with him. Uh, the July elections um, are very much a challenge. They are likely not going to take place, or if they take place uh, at all, which technically is not in the making right now, they will be enormously contested. If they don't take place, they significantly um, destabilize the peace negotiations um, because um, they will set up a very intense opportunity for the political mobilization that we have seen in Afghanistan already to do away with the negotiations and declare an interim government. There is a lot of political momentum. That would include the Taliban. There is a lot of political momentum behind that. Just about all of the um, uh, candidates who are running against President Ghani uh, would like that, uh, and all of them are trying to court the Taliban uh, to uh, support both their electoral chances down the future as well as the immediate objective of not holding uh, the election. So the Afghan uh, peace is really the, the wicked part of the negotiations. I think it's fairly easy to strike a deal in which the United States will leave and we see essentially a replay of Vietnam. We leave with the decent or indecent interval and leave it uh, up to the Afghans then to deal with the process that has very, very high chance of unraveling. Now, it's very important to understand there is tremendous optimism, desire, and craving for peace in Afghanistan. The Afghan people don't want the fighting to go on. Um, but what kind of peace, if a peace is at all achieved, what kind of peace will be reached is uh, another major question. It could very much be a peace that uh, is stable, in which the Taliban is the preponderant uh, uh, political force, and a peace that um, brings in uh, a political dispensation that looks akin to Iran or akin to Saudi Arabia. Uh, that will be a piece that will disappoint very many Afghans, including the young generation uh, that uh, we are speaking about. In some ways, that's a piece that I think would be the most stable piece, though I would say that it's not the most desirable piece uh, by any long stretch of imagination. Uh, the other issue, quite apart from the Afghan dynamic, as um, uh, uh, Steve Hadley also mentioned, of course, is the regional dimension, and we'll focus on, on Pakistan, but it's also worth to reflect on a whole set of other powers. Uh, I would emphasize Iran here that has really not been brought effectively uh, and robustly into the negotiations, um, but nonetheless Iran that has tremendous influence over Afghan politics and over uh, the Taliban, including in ways that has radically changed over the past year, really strengthening 
the Iranian voices. So there's another very large uh, sort of black hole uh, in the process currently that can play um, in multiple ways, including some um, seriously deleterious ones. Let me ask one quick follow-up before going to uh, Medea Afzal, uh, Vonda, and that's you mentioned the Saudi and Iranian models or lack thereof, undesirable models. What about the Lebanon model? Not that I'm endorsing that either, but of course Hezbollah's role as both a power in the southern part of the country that largely controls territory or runs a parallel government, but is also part of the formal central government with a certain more or less allocation of seats, but not making a grab for the entirety. Uh, is that a model that would be good enough and that's realistic? Well, I think there is certainly high potential um, for a, whether an explicit peace deal or a de facto reality in which the Taliban ends up controlling very significant uh, portions of Afghan territory. <laughs> other powers, not necessarily the Afghan government, control other parts of Afghanistan, and you have multiple levels of contestation, uh, whether political or military ones, where there is Kabul that hangs in some sort of uh, authority. I would say the model to me is perhaps less um, Lebanon, although Lebanon is a possibility, and more so um, Somalia. Very weak central government, de facto devolution of power, significant uh, territorial and other control by the Taliban, contestation in other areas. The big question in that setting is um, what is going to happen with the Afghan military? How long will the international community and the United States have the wherewithal to continue paying for Afghan national security forces in some kind of de facto arrangement of that kind? Um, I, what uh, I've been willing to uh, bet right now is that the peace deal, if there is a peace deal, it's not going to look anything like Colombia. The Taliban is not just going to say, okay, we will accept some minimal uh, leniency and penalty and we are going to DDR. There is not going to be a DDR in the way that we are used to. The Taliban will either retain its military power as a, as a parallel power to the Afghan national security forces or it will insist on significant integration into the Afghan security forces. In which case, uh, the U.S. Congress and U.S. polity get the shock of are they willing to pay for an Afghan security force that has substantial number of the Taliban in it. L not even mentioning the, the procedures and dimensions of how any such integration would look like, uh, particularly given, um, uh, particularly given uh, the, the political uh, power, the, the mostly non-Pashtun control of significant faction of the Afghan National Security Forces. I would also just add here that the deal is also not going to look anything like the deal in the Philippines where the Taliban just get some parts of the South and um, minimal influence. Um, the Afghan constitution will be very much up for grabs. Um, and more importantly, quite apart from the constitution, the actual dispensation of political control and power will be, will be highly contested. And, and the other thing that is very important to recognize is that even say that there is a deal, that there is some change to the constitutions that are acceptable, that the Taliban is formally in power in the national government and controls de facto or de jure significant portions of the territory elsewhere, that there is some sort of modus uh, vivendi. Or even that you have Saudi Arabia, Iran, or Somalia model. Under all of these circumstances, you will have a lot of external power cultivating their favorite proxies and pumping a lot of weapons and arms to them. And will that arrangement be able to survive the dynamics is a very significant question. Thank you. And I should have mentioned, uh, many of you know Vonda's book, Aspiration and Ambivalence, which is a very good history of sort of the first 13 or 14 years of this war. I guess someday you'll have to update that, and hopefully it'll have a, a positive Definitely. last chapter. We'll, time will tell. Medea, thank you for joining us today. And you are, of course, a Pakistan expert in addition to knowing the region so well. So I'd love to get your thoughts on where we stand overall, but specifically on how you see the government of Prime Minister Khan uh, playing a role in this process that may or may not be different from the role of previous Pakistani governments. Over to you. Sure. Um, so Pakistan 
is saying that it um, wants peace in Afghanistan. You know, both the, the military establishment as well as Prime Minister Khan are insisting that peace is an outcome that Pakistan wants for Afghanistan and for itself. And they're doing all they can um, to, to bring the Taliban to the table. And, and it, it seems like they've made some moves like bringing um, Baradar uh, to the table with um, Zalmay Khalilzad just over the last couple of days. Um, Imran Khan has always argued long before it became sort of um, the, the prevailing kind of um, uh, the prevailing model. Uh, he's always argued for a political settlement with the Afghan Taliban. He, in fact, gave an interview uh, a couple of months ago where he said, you know, everybody used to call me Taliban Khan because, um, because I argued for this political settlement, and now it's become fashionable to argue for this political settlement. So he, he's certainly pushing for it in that respect. Um, and given the sort of the uh, rough start to the relationship with Imran Khan, the sort of the reaching out uh, that President Trump's administration has done um, to get Pakistan to help with the peace talks, um, you know, uh, with President Trump writing a letter to Imran Khan, with Zalmay Khalilzad reaching out, Pakistan wants to be conciliatory, given that the U.S. is reaching out. So it wants to be able to show, look, we have some leverage over the Taliban. Um, we, want, we want to help here. But it is unclear to me how much Pakistan stands to gain from a resolution in Afghanistan. Um, and I say this for a couple of reasons. One, Pakistan wants pa Pakistan maintains some leverage, you know, over the Afghan Taliban, um, the way the Afghan Taliban is now, and it maintains leverage in the region with Pakistan considered an important player in the peace process. Once peace is achieved, then Pakistan's importance wanes a little bit. Pakistan also, vis-a-vis -vis its relationship with India, it's important for Pakistan um, to maintain this kind of lever that it has right now. Um, consider the current moment where Pakistan and India are sort of on the precipice of war. The U.S. is loath to sort of um, venture in and intervene because it doesn't want to anger Pakistan. If, Pakistan, uh, if, uh, if the U.S. is seen as taking a side in India, um, then Pakistan perhaps may pull out of the peace, peace talks or, or helping out with the peace talks. So it, it, it helps Pakistan to keep things at this kind of status quo temperature. Um, with um, uh, with Zaul Haq in the 1980s, you know, he talked about during the Afghan Soviet Jihad, he talked about keeping the water in Afghanistan boiling at the right temperature. He always kept saying this to his, um, the DG of, uh, the Director General of the ISI, then Akhtar um, Abdurrahman. Um, and in some ways, in, it benefits Pakistan to keep the water boiling at the right temperature, where Pakistan can be seen as some, uh, you know, as a, as a power that can bring the Afghan Taliban to the table, um, without without the Afghan Taliban actually sort of gaining a lot of power in Pakistan uh, in Afghanistan, because it does not benefit Pakistan to have the Afghan Taliban be an overt power in Afghanistan right now. Uh, and there are a couple of reasons for that. One, the Afghan Taliban has changed since the 1990s when it was uh, in power. Um, it, it has changed in the sense that now there, or the equation is different in the sense that now there is another um, body, the Pakistan Taliban, which is allied with the, the, the Afghan Taliban, but is distinct from it, that attacked the Pakistani state over the last, um, you know, 15 or... 10 plus years, and that has now got some sort of sanctuary in Afghanistan because it has been pushed by uh, Pakistan's, um, the Pakistani military's, um, Zarbia's offensive against the, the, the Pakistan Taliban. It has been pushed into Afghanistan. If the, Pakistan, if the Afghan Taliban comes into power in, in any sort of, um, in any significant way as a result of this power sharing agreement, if it comes into power in Afghanistan, then the Pakistan Taliban will be emboldened um, and it does not benefit the Pakistani state to have the Pakistan Taliban emboldened. So Pakistan is at this point, you know, in sort of this, this, so, some sort of sweet spot where um, the violence levels in Pakistan are low because the Pakistan Taliban has been driven out, but it doesn't want it to be uh, emboldened. Secondly, I'm not sure Pakistan wants a state 
such as uh, you know, sort of an Islamic theocratic kind of state to re-emerge on, on its Western frontier. In as much as Pakistan relies on Islam as a pillar, it relies on Islam in very strategic ways. And it does not benefit it to have its Islamists emboldened by having um, a state which um, has uh, sort of, which is terrible to its, its women and its minorities and which is trying to enforce some, some sort of Sharia on its western border. That's great, but I have one follow-up, and then we'll come <laughs> bring in the audience again. And just, uh, you um, made me think about which Pakistan were you talking about, which players, when you talked about their interests in keeping the conflict at sort of a simmer in Afghanistan, because if I think of a classic interpretation of Pakistani military or ISI perspective, I could see your point. But if I think about a visionary prime minister, which I hope Mr. Han is, he wants, he's got a country of 200 million people with a mediocre growth rate and a lot of challenges for their future internally as a country, and yet a proud history, and if they could get out of this rut they've been in, arguably, for 20 or 30 years, a rut that, by the way, we asked them to go in because we asked them to help us defeat the Soviet Union in the 1980s by you know, channeling resources to the Mujahideen, which then had spillover effects into Pakistan. So we're not guilt-free in this relationship by any means, and they know it, um, even if they are also not guilt-free. But anyway, you see where I'm going. Is, isn't there a division of interest within the Pakistani state, which raises the obvious question, is, is Prime Minister Han having any greater ability to essentially have, have his own vision for national security policy that supersedes the military and ISI's vision, or are the military and ISI still calling all the shots in regard to India and Afghanistan national security policy? They are still calling all the shots. So um, Prime Minister Khan certainly has some, he has sort of a, a more progressive agenda um, in terms of sort of social policy uh, within Pakistan. And he talks sense uh, on some elements of foreign policy, and it, and you can see some sorts of divisions emerging. Where he ta- you know, he talks about wanting peace with India, for instance, and he um, he created a visa-free uh, corridor for India's Sikhs to come into Pakistan. Um, but he is not going to diverge in any sort of meaningful way from the military establishment. Um, on foreign policy. That is the bargain that they have struck. Um, he is very much, they, you know, they, they seem to be in sort of lockstep right now. They, they meet multiple times a day. The military establishment says that, you know, Pakistan civilian government has decided that such and such is the policy. Imran Khan comes on TV and gives uh, speeches, you know, about, um, about uh, the strategy. But it is very clear that it is a joint strategy with the military still calling the shots. I think what he does is he puts a softer face on much of the strategy, and he's able to... Um, for, for domestically at least, you know, for the domestic audience, he's able to package it in a way that the domestic audience um, is on board uh, with it and thinks he's making the right decision. So the domestic audience sees him as being um, the, the, the sort of the one in power. But this is very much, this is very much a joint uh, policy because this is, this is the bargain by which, you know, Imran Khan gets to be prime minister. And that's not changing at all, so far at least. So far, it's not. So thank you. Let's open it up. Let's take maybe three questions at a time, and then we'll come back to the panel, do a couple rounds of Q&A here. And I'll begin with this gentleman over here in the second row, and then the gentleman in the third row after that. Uh, Jeff Stacy from Geopolicity, currently doing a UN project uh, in Afghanistan, UNDP, called the RISE Project, working on economic consolidation of the peace, assuming that it's going to happen. Your comments really struck me, both of you, but in particular what you were just saying about uh, the Pakistani leadership. So the degree to which Prime Minister Khan has said positive things about the peace process in Afghanistan and has communicated along these lines apparently to Gandhi and others, that has been sanctioned by the Chief of Staff of the Army and the Director of the ISI? Great question. Go over here to the gentleman in the third row and then to the woman in the eighth row or so. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, this is Shafiq. Uh, I'm an Afghan analyst. And 
Uh, my uh, question is uh, regarding the uh, suggestions uh, to share power between Afghan government or Taliban. Uh, I would suggest and say, you know, as a scholar or as a, you know, analyst or expert, we have to be accountable when we should have the sense that, you know, we, we are sharing views uh, with people and it has to be very responsible. For example, when we bring example of Bosnia and Herzegovina, we bring example of Lebanon or any other country, uh, I hope there was a map of Afghanistan that they would show where, if you want to share the power with Taliban, which location that will be. Taliban are all over. They are in, in Kandahar, they are in Nangarhar, they are in Kunduz, they are in Herat. Means they are all over Afghanistan. It's, the situation in Afghanistan is absolutely different. So I think uh, my suggestion is that we have to be uh, at least cautious and uh, you know, be mindful when we have such suggestions. And regarding Pakistan, uh, you know, uh, looking at Mr. Khan, I used to work for NATO as a senior advisor in Afghanistan. The issue is the biggest trouble for the NATO U.S. forces in Afghanistan at the time was uh, not only Taliban, but it was Imran Khan, who was provoking people to loot convoys of uh, NATO and U.S. forces coming to Afghanistan. And he gained the power through, uh, you know, uh, I would say uh, provocative statements against U.S. and NATO in Afghanistan and gaining support of the Taliban, uh, Pakistani Taliban. And we should not forget that right now, probably in a few Few, few months or uh, the years coming up, Pakistan will turn again a safe havens for global terror because that's the experience that we have from South Asia. Whenever there is a conflict between India and Pakistan, Pakistan turns to a party place uh, for the global terrorism. So aren't you concerned that tension between India and Pakistan will push farther Khan to you know, facilitate for more terrorism to come and use uh, Pakistan? Thank you. And then, woman, right there. Yes, please. This is Pausme Akbarzai, intern at the Embassy of Afghanistan. My question is a bit more specific, taking the most exploited section of society into account, the women in Afghanistan. When we talk about it, like in post-2001 Afghanistan, the international community in general and United States in particular played a significant role in ensuring rights and liberties of women. Um, through a number of programs like establishing institutions or um, capacity building programs and also reservation which were completely alien to the Afghan establishment, um, quotas and reservations. Uh, but when we talk about the peace negotiations, taking the highly patriarchal aspect and male-dominated aspect of Afghanistan into account and the conservative society, there is always a fear amongst women that how would we, would we be able to surrender the hard-earned rights and liberties back to Taliban and to the new establishment or in the, uh, anything that comes into settlement in the peace negotiations. So my question is that what role the United States and international community should play in the best possible representation of women? in this peace negotiation. Excellent. So let's work down the road. I'm just going to make one small comment in regard to the gentleman's point. I heard a lot of nuance about, Vonda kept explaining why different models might not work. We're all in search of a model. We're going to, we're going to have to invent, the Afghans are going to have to invent an Afghan model. What we're asking is can we borrow from here and borrow from there? But as you point out, as she pointed out, I think quite clearly, there are challenges in doing this uh, regardless of which example from other countries you might try to cite. So uh, with that, Medea, why don't we go to you on any of the Pakistan-related questions, and then Vonda, whatever you would like to, including the women's rights question, please. Sure. Um, on, on your question, yes, um, uh, Pakistan's ISI and, and military establishment, um, that's, they're saying that overtly as well. The Director General of the Inter-Services uh, Inter Personal Relations has stated that he wants peace uh, in Afghanistan. I mean, that's, and, and, and wants the peace talks to succeed. Pakistan overtly wants the peace talks to succeed also because Pakistan says that it wants its refugees 
uh, all the Afghan refugees that that have been in Pakistan for um, more than more than two decades, um, uh, millions of them, to to you know b uh, find a way to be repatriated uh, back to Afghanistan. So that's another reason uh, it wants peace. So that that's you know they're on the same page here. Um, I think on on your question very quickly, um, Pakistan's narratives on Afghanistan, the U.S. and the Afghan Taliban, which Mike also alluded to, are important here. What you say about uh, now Prime Minister Khan's narratives back in. Um, you know, uh, uh, in the wake of the, the U.S. war in Afghanistan, you know, post-2001, that's in some ways a very, that's a narrative that many Pakistanis have. You know, Pakistan says that it was forced to sign on to the U.S. war on terror um, with hugely negative consequences for Pakistan because Pakistan says um, that the creation of then the, the Pakistan Taliban uh, post-2007 uh, occurred because Pakistan allied with the U.S. war on terror, and then Pakistan has suffered not only terrorist attacks, uh, but you know tens of thousands of civilians killed, lots of um, uh, you know money lost, um, and so so Pakistan in that sense decries uh, sort of the, the U.S. war on terror. But now it does not want America to leave in a hurry. That is really really important because a hugely important narrative in Pakistan is also the post. Um, Soviet Afghan war abandonment, as Pakistan calls it, you know, of, uh, of of the region by the United States, and the fact that millions of refugees entered Pakistan post 1989, you know, that is cited by Pakistan as a hugely sort of negative consequence of the Soviet Afghan war, among among other things. And, and so right now, Pakistan, um, and and you know, Imran Khan has said this. Um, Pakistan's again military establishment has said this. Has said this that they do not want the U.S. to leave in a hurry. So these narratives are, it's not something that Imran Khan was saying. Perhaps he was the most candid uh, the, of the, the lot. But these are narratives that are pretty common in the country. Thank you. Fonda, over to you. Well, I would add um, two things on Pakistan. Uh, it might be that Pakistan prefers a certain simmering conflict. Uh, the worst outcome for Pakistan is very intense civil war and chaos. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, peace it might not be optimal, but, and particularly certain configurations of peace might not be optimal, but they are preferable to civil war and chaos, even from Pakistan's perspective, which is not to say that Pakistan couldn't live with it. It might have to, but uh, that's uh, not what they want. I would point out that the current um, India-Pakistan uh, skirmish uh, is significant, not just on its own terms and the implications for uh, peace and stability in that region, but uh, I look at Marvin and uh, the, the godfather of Afghanistan and South Asia um, studies and his own knowledge of every time there is a little bit of breakthrough in uh, India-Pakistan negotiations, something goes off. Now that there is quite a bit of breakthrough in the U.S. Taliban negotiations, however desirable and optimal, something significant blows off. Is that merely coincidental? Um, of course, the um, instability in Kashmir has been going on for uh, several months. It's really been the worst summer and very difficult fall. There is a lot of that's been boiling up and preceding um, the uh, attack that set off the crisis. But one only needs to wonder um, how um, the timing coincides with the Qatar negotiations and the progress there. The thing, though, that I would also add to that is that um, the Afghan Taliban wants to get rid of Pakistan. They, they might be dependent uh, on Pakistan, but there is no love lost for Pakistan at all, including the ISI. And many a Taliban uh, leader has uh, explicitly said uh, Pakistan is a yoke that we want to get rid of. Uh, and Pakistan is aware of that. They, hence the fear of peace uh, that would loosen uh, the grip that Pakistan has uh, on the Afghan Taliban. On the issue, uh, and, uh, on the issue of, of peace, I absolutely agree that one of the real difficulties is that the Taliban is all over the place. They are very strong in the north. And so if a peace doesn't break out, if instead civil wars continues intensifying, we will have a very messy situation with a lot of the north very intensely challenged. The Taliban has significantly and effectively recruited minorities in the north. It has Tajik units, it has Uzbek units. 
Um, if it were really to disintegrate into civil war, it would be very nasty, very difficult, very, very bloody civil war. None at all the, the line moving north over the Shomali, lane, uh, Shomali plain like we saw in the 1990s. But conversely, that also implies very strongly that it is very unrealistic that you have something like the Philippine scenario, that the Taliban is simply satisfied with merely some provincial level of power. They will be asking for a lot of power in Kabul. How that is configured, uh, if it is configured, remains to be seen. But it's not just going to be little territorial division in a peace deal. And so to go to another model, we can think of the end of the um, civil war in Nepal, in which the Maoists essentially won, and they came to be the dominant power. Now, along with the, and they became good capitalists, among other things, or at least crony capitalists, if not good ones, and the country continues to be in a, in a morass and persistent, terrible governance challenges since the peace deal. But it hasn't blown up into full-blown um, fighting. Now, the one thing that the, that the Nepal peace negotiations had, and that would be most desirable, and this links to the issue of women, was a significant representation of minorities, uh, oppressed castes, and women in the negotiations, in, in the, con in the uh, setting up of the interim constitution, and finally, a decade later, the ultimate constitution. That is how the Afghan negotiations should have taken place. This is how they still should take place as much as possible, at least beyond the U.S.-Taliban peace. But look who went to Moscow. The images from Moscow were enormously distressing. This was the turbaned male geriatric crowd with some younger warlords <laughs> and two token women. It was definitely in no way representative of the Afghan uh, society. And I fear very much that, um, the represent, the, that the negotiations on the Afghan side will end up being among the power brokers and the far more fundamental reckoning that needs to take place in the Afghan society, one that uh, builds in much more pluralism than it is right now. The constitution is one thing. In practice, the polity is not pluralistic. In practice, women are significantly oppressed. And the condition is much worse in today than it was in 2006. There have been very significant backsliding, regardless of what's in the constitution. I feel very much that if there is a peace deal, it will be a peace deal that's tremendously disappointing. So we have time for one more round of questions, after which we have to leave quickly at 3.15. My apologies. We have a little bit of constriction on our schedule here at Brookings. So at that point, I'll ask you to uh, leave promptly and even bring your garbage and cups out with you, please. So <laughs> I apologize in advance. But don't worry, national season is going to begin soon, so you can leave all your garbage at Nats Park. Just please take it with you today. Um, and let's see if we can do one last quick round and finish up in about eight minutes. So I see a gentleman out there in the, right next to the woman who asked the uh, last question. And then we'll come over here to this gentleman, and then finally to the second row. Yeah, thank you. My name is Barakat, and my question is to Ms. Mariha. You mentioned that uh, Pakistan's, uh, Pakistan is not pre uh, pretty much willing to see a peace deal in Afghanistan because it, leave, it leaves Pakistan without a playing card in the region. But you also mentioned that the uh, statement by Imran Khan in support of the peace process is also supported by a statement by ISPR spokesperson. So how do you balance this contradiction? Thank you. And over here, please. <clears throat> Hi, uh, Matt Woody with the uh, Defense Industry. My question is, what does China play in all of this? Uh, certainly, they're in Afghanistan from a commercial standpoint, um, but maybe more importantly, is their growing influence in Pakistan and how they use that to leverage against India? Great. And then finally here, just one question this time. One part, one question. We hear a lot uh, about the gains of the past 18 years by U.S. help to the Afghan government. And we are also talking about the human rights, about the women's rights, about education. So I believe the most important gain is the constitution in the election. Now that we hear here, even there is a negotiation or discussion about the election, whether it can be held or it should be held, or we should be given the peace process. Uh, what do you think the election should be held or not? Because most of the Afghan thinks that they have a legitimate, they're proud of their election and legitimate elected government. 
Thank you. So why don't we start with Vonda for this round and then finish with Medea. Uh, well, thank you. Um, you know, the responsibility and, frankly, the blame is very much with the Afghan government and Afghan political class for the state of elections. Every single time elections have been held in Afghanistan, a costly but very important exercise, there have been enormous technical problems, but they could have been resolved. I find it absolutely heartbreaking to see how many Afghan people showed up for the parliamentary elections at significant risk, and yet the elections have not been announced for a vast number of seats. There was tremendous amount of fraud. The election commission, both the IEC and the ECC, have been dismissed. And it did not have to happen. We did not have to be in this situation. Uh, President Ghani and uh, CEO Abdullah Abdullah came to power promising to clean up elections. In fact, they also promised switch to parliamentary elections and lots of other stuff, and it did not happen. Now we are um, the beginning of March. We have a few months to July, and the, both of the ECC and the ICC have been dismantled, and all the problems that surface in the parliamentary elections are not resolved. So I want elections to be held. I think they are important. Uh, I also really am deeply, deeply skeptical that the systems will be in place uh, by July to hold them. Then we get into complex scheduling, but it is quite possible that even the first round of elections will not take place this year, which has tremendously significant uh, impact on the Taliban negotiations. I would just um, sort of add one comment on, on Pakistan toward the end. Um, look, we, are, uh, we could have been meeting here last year, and there would have been um, some cheering in Washington about how we finally have a uh, U.S. presidential administration that has gotten tough with Pakistan, and yet Pakistan has managed to pull off exactly the same play that it did over and over and over, that Pakistan has delivered a little bit of breakthrough in negotiations to redeem um, its um, relationship with Washington without any significant change on this policy. We should be reflecting on that. All the drumbeat uh, last year, the president's tweets in January, how tough we are do, uh, getting on Pakistan and the state of play uh, where we are today and um, how uh, we got to that. And that uh, uh, has many sources, one of which is also China, and the fact that uh, for many uh, uh, Afghan experts, China was seen at one point as the silver bullet because of Chinese um, interest all board in CPAC. Uh, China would finally manage what the United States has failed for two decades and more, namely to get Pakistan to start acting robustly and uh, non-selectively against militant groups. Instead, Pakistan has managed to persuade China that it can take care of the militants that are dangerous for China, and China, as a result of its um, anti-Uyghur policies, now believes that it can control through its own internal policies that space without having to pressure Pakistan uh, to act more uniformly. In Afghanistan, China is... Um, uh, ambivalent um, uh, about the um, outcomes, but it also has very heavily courted uh, the Taliban. It flies the Taliban and to China uh, regularly and a lot. It wines and dines the Taliban, including potential with the wine, uh, as are doing other powers, Moscow, Iran, and uh, all kinds of other actors. So China, like Russia uh, and like Iran, have fundamentally come to believe that they can live and deal with a Taliban with either significant influence in the country or de facto power uh, in the country. And that, that Taliban can guarantee Chinese interest, which would be um, no support for Uyghurs or any kind of um, uh, militancy in, um, in Xinjiang. And perhaps the, the, the greatest noise is the deafening silence of the Taliban and other actors on the situation in Xinjiang and the Uyghurs, not a peep of supporting Muslim brothers. Uh, and uh, Taliban is also very explicit that it doesn't want, that it might want significant changes in um, 
social order, but it doesn't want economic aid to stop. It, it doesn't want to play that same economic policies as it did in the 1990s. It's telling us, the United States, and when we have a deal, don't stop the aid. We want your aid. We just want to decide where it will go and how. And uh, the Taliban is giving that same message to China. When we are in power, you know, please start mining uh, at Ainak. And Medea, last word to you, please. Sure. Um, on this on gentleman's question right there. Um, so there's an official line, which is, look, we want to move the peace process along. And that is very much the official line. And I will say that Prime Minister Khan probably sincerely believes in that official line to some extent as well. That's, that's what he has said all along. So Pakistan will move the process along. But for Pakistan, you know, peace talks, a permanent state of moving the process along for peace talks is better than certain types of peace, right, where the Taliban is ascendant, where the Taliban um, causes problems for Pakistan, um, A, because of its alliance with the, the Pakistan Taliban. So when I say Taliban, I mean Afghan Taliban, you know, and then the Taliban's alliance with the Pakistan Taliban, and, and, and for other reasons. Um, and also Pakistan loses its, um, its standing as a key player in this conflict, and it benefits it to keep that standing going. So that is something you will not hear ever officially from any Pakistani you know, officials, uh, government, military. But it is something um, that I'm sure it's thought about and that you know, the end game, there's only a very specific kind of end game and a specific kind of power sharing agreement that would benefit Pakistan more than the current status quo of keeping these talks moving um, uh, without ever reaching a resolution. And, and maintaining its sort of power. Um, very quickly on, on, on China, and I think uh, the question was on China, Pakistan, and India. Um, uh, so just on that, I, I, I think China has maintained neutrality over the last few days, and I don't see China as um, helping de-escalate this conflict. Ultimately, both these powers, Pakistan and India, will have to de-escalate the conflict. Um, and the incentives very much, if they're for the world to de-escalate the conflict, the incentives are very much for them to do so because they're both nuclear powers. And you know, the fate of uh, one and a half billion people stand in the balance of, of, of uh, the de-escalation of this conflict. So ultimately, they have to do it. Fantastic. Thank you all for being here. Please join me in thanking the panel. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.